Kwe Kwe, this is Stephen Ojiri on May 6, 2017 with an update. Um, okay, so as some of you know, okay, this uh, audio is going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be an update on my Kusunokiru project. And the second part is going to be an interesting experiment that I want to do. Uh, the, so the first part is going to be update in history, and the second part is actually what's going to be called a direct application. Like, um, so the first part is going to talk about Kusunokiru historically, and the second part is going to be my uh, meandering through applying some Kusunokiru principles into a modern day application. And it it's based solely off of my own experience and my own thoughts. So uh, if you after I get through with the update, the historical material, if you are not interested in my meanderings, my rambling, uh, you can stop this audio at that point. But if you want to hear me sort of ramble on about something in relation to my personal experience and the Kusunokiru teachings, then of course continue uh, listening. Now the first part, okay, update on Kusunokiru. Um, I have now... I. How do I say this? Without rambling on too long, I now have the material that would be considered the root material. Kusunokiru is a is is a massive system if you consider all of the different components and different branches and different things that were added throughout the years, etc., etc., etc. However, the actual root system is of course much simpler than all of those other factors combined. So if we want to say what is Kusunokiru at its heart, what is the root fundamental system, that would be the material of Kusunoki Masashige which was passed down to his sons Matsutsura and Masanori and then um, continued down within the Kusunoki, the main line leading up to Kusunoki Masatora. After Kusunoki Masatora what happens to the main line is debatable there's evidence for it going this way, there's evidence for it going that way. Some researchers have connected Kusunoki Masatora to Kusunoki Masatatsu, who they believe is Kusunoki Fuden, which would then be the teacher of Yui Shosetsu, which would then, uh, which is the route through which Natoriru, for example, is connected. Um, but that is actually, actually, I have, um, I've been having some really good conversations with uh, Natori Ryu's uh, instru- um, with Anthony Cummins and we've talked extensively about Natori Ryu and Kusunoki Ryu and the relationships what's and political I- ideologies spiritual ideologies, historical realities, historical theories so we've talked pretty extensively about Kusunoki Ryu and Natori Ryu um, but I will allow I, but because that goes into the area of Natoriru. I will let him handle that. At some point in the future, he will release books and, and, and videos and stuff detailing the relationship of Natoriru to Kusunokiru. So I won't, um, I'm not going there. Besides that, Natoriru is a far branch. Um, and actually, of course, it's more complicated than that because uh, you can't really say Natoriru is a branch of Kusunokiru. It's more Natoriru is a school that happens to have a branch of Kusunokiru tied into it. But again, that's for him to discuss. That's too far off of topic. The, so what is on topic is to c- cut all the way back to Kusunoki Masatora and all the way back to Kusunoki Masashige, this main line. From the main line, numerous branches spawn off. But what I want to focus on is that main school, the, the, the root intentionality, the root, the fundamentals of what is Kusunoki. And I have that material now. I have what appears to be, and what I believe, for lack of a better word, what I believe to be the fundamentals of the root system. And what is very interesting is the fundamentals of the root system are not what most people would assume that they were. Most people assume that the fundamentals of Kusunokiru is a series of battle tactics and and, and and war tricks and different ways to build castles and different ways to set up soldiers and armor. And that material does exist in Kusunokiru, but it's not actually the root material. The root material, the 
fundamental teachings of Kusunokiru, the things that really make Kusunokiru Kusunokiru, the, the stuff that is consistently the foundation of everything is spirituality, worldview, politics, sociology, psychology, magic. It's actually, what's interesting is the, the actual battle tactics are not the fundamental roots the fundamental root is ideology. Um, for example, the, the text even says, you know, like as times change, tactics must change. Therefore, you can learn tactics of one age, but they have to change and shift to match the age at which they manifest. Therefore, more important than learning battle formations, of course, battle formations are important, but rather than memorizing and learning set formations, what's more important is learning the theory behind the formations, the spirituality behind the formations, right? In other words, what's more important is always getting to the fundamental mechanics of the topic rather than trying to just memorize. So for example, um, to use martial arts as an example, it would be not memorizing the kata, but memorizing the reason for the kata, right? So that you can always rebuild a kata right or, or you know what i mean and i know that's a that's kind of a controversial viewpoint but that is the viewpoint of kusunokiru it's not to learn a series of set movements or set tactics there are tactics which are created by kusunoki masashige and masanori but they are you're it's they're they're learned as examples of the principle which you are supposed to learn. So for Kusunokiru, so you can say Kusunokiru fundamentally is a set of principles, is a set of ideas. And from those ideas, you can birth tactics. And there are historical tactics, but the historical tactics are examples of which to then master the principle. So in a, in a way, you can fundamentally grasp Kusunokiru based on the principles. So, um, if that doesn't make sense, let me try to say it a different way. Kusunokiru is a school of psychology, spirituality, and politics. And from those three factors, you can then create war tactics. And you say, but what about the movement of troops, and what about this and this? Also, you have to remember Kusunokiru is for small forces. Uh, it doesn't get into extremely large forces. I think I've said this before on another video or something, but I ideally the Akusunokiru force is 500 men or whatever, 500 people. 500 people is not a large standing army. It's not a 500 people is relatively small it's big, like don't give me a 500 people is a lot, but it's also in the grand scheme of things, it's also relatively small too. So it's not a massive army. It is a, it is a, a small force. So Kusunokiru's number is roughly about 500. Now, of course, there are some tactics for larger forces, et cetera, et cetera. But ideally, you're talking about guerrilla warfare. You're talking about smaller, uh, it's an army, but it's a small army, right? It's 500 people is sort of the max number. So, the, the point of Kusunokiru is, is and, I, and this, a lot of people think that I might be bullshitting and whatever. In the text, fundamental, a fundamental principle of Kusunokiru is damage mitigation. Kusunokiru, I shit you not, is extremely concerned with the overall cost of life uh, and, and resources and infrastructure of the people. Kusunokiru is very, very got, has a very big um, slant towards making sure that the people as a whole are taken care of. So there, because a member like government, uh, sociology, psychology, spirituality, politics, these all are mixing in here. Um, for example, in Kusunokiru, there is absolutely this entire sense of seeing the. Um, how do I say this? A fundamental principle of Kusunokiru is to always consider the enemy as part of your own self. 
in other words, and you see this reflected a little bit in Natoriru, uh, in the Shoninki. You see that a little bit of trace of that reflected. Um, so bust open your Shonen key and near the end when he gets very esoteric you'll see a little bit of traces about not destroying something completely but there's this entire aspect that when you for Kusunakiru when you're looking at the enemy you're not supposed to be considering that the enemy is something that you have to destroy and completely scorch earth but that the you're, uh, you're, you're, you need to defeat this enemy with a minimal loss of life, minimal loss of resources. And therefore, in Kusunokiru, one of the key points becomes how can we disassemble the enemy without directly fighting them? Of course, if you have to directly fight them. Now, you got to remember, though. If you have a massive army of 20,000 people, this is a different scenario. But remember, Kusunokiru is for 500 people or less. So how can we destroy a large enemy? Well, we can't obviously just assault them because there's only there's 500 or less of us, right? We defeat a large force by disassembling the force. So this is where the conspiracy comes in. So conspiracy is actually a fundamental aspect of Kusunokiru. Kusunokiru is a system it's always talked about like it's a it's a heiho system it's a system of battle tactics and stuff but truly kusunokiru fundamentally is a system of conspiracy if you end up having to defend a castle or siege a castle that happens but even that happens from a conspirator viewpoint it's not like how can we you know burn this castle down and ravage it and destroy and kill everyone it's how can we get people inside the castle to manipulate people inside the castle like how can we put our guys in the castle have them manipulate people inside the castle to surrender the castle or to open the gates of the, you know what I mean so it conspiracy is fundamental so with Kusunokiru everything is conspiracy everything is fundamentally a conspiracy because uh, it has to avoid loss of life it has to avoid loss of property etc etc it has to be not a burden upon the people etc 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 these are the things that are literally written in the root text minimal loss of life minimal loss of property minimal strain upon the the civilian population right how can you know on on the on the normal non-combatants Right. Because, you know, large military campaigns with all of these soldiers, you got to remember, you're talking about villages get wiped out. People get taxed. People starve. You know, the it's a it, and it's reflective of what's written in a lot of the Chinese classics, especially when Sun Tzu talks about the cost of warfare. How in the, for example, like the spy chapter, you know, he talks about how you have to have spies to make sure that your war doesn't linger on for years and years because the cost of war is astronomical psychologically and economically on the common people. And Kusunokiru absolutely reflects that. Absolutely reflects that by saying, you know, it's we the loss of life because in Kusunokiru, you're not allowed to view the enemy as a non-human you know most of the time we're like oh yeah fuck those fill in the blanks they're just a bunch of animals fuck them they don't you know we don't care if they live or die we're going to kill as many as we want to yada yada kusunokiru doesn't allow you that privilege fundamentally within kusunokiru one of the teachings one of the 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 things you have to sort of ingrain in your mind stream to be an actual Kusunokiru student is that you have to view everybody as your responsibility enemies included so your responsibility isn't to just murder as many enemies as you can. Your responsibility is to try to turn the enemy into your ally. Fundamentally, Kusunokiru places the emphasis and gives you a cookie, rewards you, says that you are a good Kusunokiru student if you turn the enemy to your cause. If you, if you murder the enemy, that's actually considered not that good a Kusunokiru student. The, the good student, the A student, is the one that turns the enemy into an ally. Now, fun, now Kusunokiru, of course, isn't pure, isn't like all rainbows and wind chimes. It knows that as warriors, you will kill each other. So the idea here is damage mitigation. It's fully understood and comprehended that you will kill other people. Other people will die in war. But the idea is to mitigate that damage as much as possible. 
Reduce the suffering upon the population as much as possible. Reduce the overall death, the body count as much as possible. Uh, reduce the overall sociological impact because you know a war doesn't just cost people at the time of the war the cost of the war is generational it's impacted it, it impacts society for generations afterwards and kusanakiru talks about this it talks about how you know a war at point x doesn't just cost the people at point x it costs the people at point x at point y at point z generationally there's there is continuous residual effects of any massive campaign and so therefore because kusunokiru's fundamental principle is to protect the nation to the people to to guard the peace and prosperity of the people then you have to make sure that whatever military campaign takes place it has the smallest footprint as possible on the overall um, uh, health of the nation of the people which means guerrilla warfare tactic proxy wars shadow wars conspiracy things that are not engulfing the countryside in fire and bloodshed so kusunokiru is all about shadow government it's all about assassinations and conspiracy and betrayal and doing shit behind the scenes because that mitigates the cost on the common person for generations <clears throat> so for example um yeah let me look at uh let me think uh, uh i am now hold on i'm going to open up sacred conspiracy and we go to page 107 where i talk about the five factors if you have this now page 107 in sacred conspiracy comes from the fukushima do the scroll of refining intention but um i've laid out the five constant factors and so like for example how the five constant factors are understood uh in terms of culture and society and then on 108 it's how they can be understood for the individual person so that fundamentally this is like a kusunokiru kind of perspective in the sense that um usually when people consider the the five factors they're always thinking about oh how it is in terms of the armor or the horses or the moving of the troops but for kusunokiru it's more like how is it politically or sociologically right so the emphasis in kusunokiru is on the mind and on the manipulation of other people's minds or the manipulation of society the manipulation of social trends stuff like that so you can say that kusunokiru yes kusunokiru absolutely has an entire section about battle tactics and formations and thing and ways to actually engage in combat there is an entire section but the root, the fundamental root of Kusunokiru is spirituality and sociology, political science. Uh, so, uh, you know what I mean? Psychology, sociology, political science, uh, anthropology, shit, uh, and spirituality, whatever. The study of the human being as a human being. Now, I specifically say spirituality because I must emphasize here there is, in Kusunokiru, there is no division between magic and and politics we in 2017 western you know in a, a western Euro, you know western european american kind of first world country perspective we would think that okay well politics is in this box and spirituality is in this box and and sociology is in this box that they would you know we modern day 2017 western people tend to isolate these things as separate categories but i must emphasize that in kusunokiru there is no distinction you learn spells at the exact same time that you learn psychology psychology is magic magic is psychology magic is sociology sociology is magic politics is magic politics is spirituality spirituality is sociology sociology is magic magic is politics there these there's no distinction psychology is politics psychology is magic psychology is sociology though so there is no distinct kusunokiru does not make any of these distinctions i am making the distinctions for the purpose of explaining it to you but in kusunokiru there's no distinction 
you'll be you'll there'll be a teaching about government and how government is built and how government collapses and at the same time you're being taught spiritual you're being taught magical spells at the same time there'll be something discussing the psychology of depression or in the psychology of um, cowardice or something but then there'll be magic or there'll be some kind of sociological political government thing thrown in so there is no distinction you would in Kusunokiru it all flows together so if when you study Kusunokiru you just accept that these things are all one Kusunokiru is this massively beautiful orchestra but if your mind is not very adaptable and your mind is not very flexible you might find it very jarring to jump from like political science into a religious chant you know one you know you're learning about the the formation of government and then in the middle of the formation of government you're giving a spiritual exercise and then a psychology exercise and then you're back to political science all within the same page of text but in kusunokiru it it makes sense so um it, whenever i get around to translating all this material that's something that you guys just need to be aware of you're gonna it's going to feel you know some of you may be feel very jarred very jarring to hop what you might consider to be separate sciences but just to slur them all together there's like no there's no um yeah because for example like sometimes it'll say that it's going to teach you a magic spell but then the magic spell is something that we would consider psychology or the magic spell is something we might consider to be politics but then it might tell you that it's going to teach you something about government and then have you do a ritual so it just like it makes sense within its own context but some of you might find it very jarring to sort of like not have any distinction between these things you would normally distinguish so emphasis on the mind and manipulation um let's see what else some other things um if you look in sacred can this one is kind of fun i like this one um where are we at okay in sacred conspiracy on page 17 i discussed the uh this the story about genji yoremitsu having a vision of hachiman daibosatsu and hachiman daibosatsu giving him hijitsu which would later become ninjitsu um kusunokiru is fundamentally rooted in Hachiman Daibosatsu and I'll leave it at that I won't go into any more details um, there is all I can say is there's a very vivid rich complex completely intertwined within Kusunokiru this emphasis on Hachiman Daibosatsu <coughs> but I won't go into that anymore I'll leave it at that um, let's see and then the idea of war tactics so we have this massive spiritual political science psychology sociology system which then on top of that so that becomes the fundamental root that becomes the basis and then from that you have a series of battle tactics and battle uh, tricks and and battle um ta yeah battle tactics you know uh, formations tactics <coughs> combat tricks <coughs> that are the initial ones that come with the system so the ones formed by Kusunoki Masashige and Masanori then all of the branch schools throughout the years have added their own material to it so this is where it gets interesting because you'll have something claimed to be Kusunoki Ryu and it has the battle tactics but it doesn't have the sociology <coughs> so therefore one you can't really call it a branch of I can't really call it Kusunoki they can say this has inherited some of the battle tactics of Kusunoki but it's not really appropriate to consider it Kusunoki Ru because the fundamental root system the system of psychology and political manipulation conspiracy sociology spiritual all of that fundamental system isn't present <coughs> sorry if it's not present then can we really even consider this Kusunoki anymore? And that's a debate, that's a question that will come up in the future. <coughs> so human psyche is the constant factor. Sociology is the constant factor. 
I don't know. And so that's the thing. So that's what you guys need to understand. Kusunoki Ru, fundamentally, it's at its root is a system of the human psyche, of politics, of sociology, and religion is just all mixed in there. Then after that is this, ma so there's this massive system of mind training and social sociology training, psychology training, political science training, etc. Then from that, being a conspirator is the first and foremost of all the, of all the skills. <clears throat> then after being a conspirator or a tactician slash conspiracy, uh, master of conspiracy, conspirator, then you get into battle formations, battle tactics, etc., etc. But as Kusunokiru itself explains, the battle formations and tactics and the technology used changes all the time. So you can't really... You need to marry yourself to the root teachings and to conspiracy. That's what you need to become a master of. And then once you have a good grasp on that, just keep up date with the technology and keep up date with the new tactics. Because cities are built differently, armor is made differently, buildings are constructed differently. You know, shit changes, but the human psyche doesn't. The, the the human psyche is the same as it is now as it was 500 years ago as the same as it was a thousand years ago the rules of being a human being haven't changed so the technology changes but being human doesn't and therefore if you if you become a specialist on the human mind and how to manipulate the human mind then you're a kusunokiru specialist right so kusunokiru a, a kusunokiru student is a is a student of the human psyche first and foremost fundamentally emphasis on manipulation of human affairs then because you are also a samurai bushi you then have to engage in combat and warfare so then the combat and warfare you engage in is flavored by you being a conspirator so literally the way that you arrange your, your units and the way that you fight war is going to be different because fundamentally your emphasis is on conspiracy and manipulation and deception and redirection and sleight of hand. So you fight differently. And I guess that's one of the key things that this audio, what I'm trying to get through with this audio is that it's all, it's, it's about, Kusunokiru is about conspiracy foremost, fundamentally. A lot of researchers, Japanese and non-Japanese, who haven't dove into the system have this idea that it is fundamentally a system of tactics and warfare and like engaging troops. And again, all of that stuff absolutely exists in the system. But fundamentally, the real, the real heart of Kusunokiru, the main part, the thing that makes Kusunokiru Kusunokiru is that it's a system of conspiracy. It is a system of plotting and manipulation. So, <clears throat> all right, now with that said, so there you go. There is an update. Then um, now that hopefully you've been sort of, your understanding of Kusunokiru has been refined, you can then, you know, have a think about that so that when the book comes out, you'll, you will know that it will not be a book of battle tactics. It'll be mostly a book about the human mind and how to manipulate the human mind. Um, and you'll see that, like, now obviously you'll read it, but even when you get into the conspiracies, like in Kusunokiru, the first battle tactic, quote unquote, the first battle tactic is actually, even though it's called a battle tactic or a battle formation, really it's more of a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. It's not even like a battle formation. It's a, it's a it's a tactic for taking a castle but it has nothing to do with well i mean of course it has to do with soldiers fighting but i mean at its heart it's not about how to siege a castle and lay waste to a castle or how to kill people uh the 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 fundamental tactic for sieging a castle in kusunokiru has everything to do with manipulation of the general and his lieutenants within inside the castle and it has hardly shit to do with anything about 
bows and arrows and swords and cannons and shit. It's it's really about something else. So you'll read about it when the book comes out. But I but it's uh it's important you know before the book comes out that everybody understands Kusanokiru is about conspiracy. It is fundamentally a conspirators system, a system of conspiracy, and. It just so happens that they, these conspirators are also samurai, therefore they fight war. But they fight war very, very differently because at their heart they are manipulators of mind and manipulators of social trend. All right, so with that having been said, now I'm going to try to utilize some of the Kusunokiru teachings within a modern application to sort of give you an idea. All right, so if you're not interested in hearing this part, you should turn it off now. You've been told, you've been introduced to Kusunokiru and that Kusunokiru is a system for conspiracy and uh, that the book will show you this clearly. You'll see, you know. And I'm not saying you won't see warfare, but I'm saying you will see that, that warfare is, is because they're samurai, so they're obviously going to fight. But that the heart of the system is conspiracy. This will make so much sense once you actually start reading the translation. <coughs> but now, so, all right, so if you're done, turn it off. Now, if you want to hear me ramble on some more, keep listening. So, 2017, let's try to apply some Kusunoki, um, some Kusunoki principles into what is called pretexting. <coughs> As some of you know, I used to do investigative work. I don't really do it right now, but I used to do investigative work. I loved it. It's my favorite job in the world is, is investigator. Within that field of work, there's something called pretexting. Now, a lot of people will tell you that pretexting means that you lie about who you are and why you're there. But we use a different word. We say pretexting because lying is, not, uh, on one hand, it's, you know, we don't want to say we lie, but now, now we're, now here in comes some Kusunoki, so I'm going to apply, now I'm going to start applying some Kusunoki thinking to this. <clears throat> Pretexting is not lying. And the reason is because lying is, there's a fundamental relationship here. You have the truth, you have a lie, and then you have a massive gray area in between. The truth is not something that human beings ever experience. The only way to experience the truth is to become enlightened. And the reason for that is every single experience that you have a conscious perception of is some event, some sound, some light, some noise that occurred and then entered into your sense field and then went through the five skanda which is a Buddhist term, uh, you can say, went through psychological filters, right? <clears throat> For example, had to go through your eye, like, or you heard something, right? So the ear sense had to sense the sense it. And then that goes into, you know, it has to be processed by your brain. That filters through past habituations. That filters through any sort of emotional reactivity. There's all of these different filters that that sound has to travel through before your brain then reconstructs it into a perceivable signal for your conscious mind to be aware of. So you never actually hear anything other than your own self-perception. <clears throat> now science teaches this now in 2017, but Buddhism has taught this since that you know thousands of years ago right since the time of buddha has taught the five skanda it's one of the fundamental teachings of buddhism the five skanda in other words uh that very very simple teaching that says you can't believe what you hear and see as being actual reality because it's not everything you hear see taste touch everything is a product of your perception <clears throat> and because it is a product of your perception it is susceptible to flaw so therefore, as a human being who is not enlightened, you never experience the truth, ever. Science even teaches us that everything we experience is a something interpreted by our brain. 
everything we experience is uh, so many milliseconds behind. When we hear a sound, that sound's actually happened yay many milliseconds before our brain uh, is aware of it. And that's because it takes that many milliseconds for the, the sound to travel through the air and to go through all of our filters and to become a conscious thought or conscious perception, et cetera, et cetera. So we constantly live like half a second in the past, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so as human beings, we never experience the truth. So therefore, within the context of pretexting for an investigation, you, you have to do away with the idea that truth is involved, right? Now you're left with just the gray and a lie. And a lie is extremely easy to pinpoint. A lie, unlike the truth, a lie is very simple. A lie is just fabricated. Pure fabrication. A lie is nothing to do with the gray, right? So we, we say we, we, cannot active, we cannot access truth. As unlightened human beings, we cannot access truth. We cannot have a direct, unfiltered perception of reality unless we're enlightened. So therefore, we have to take truth off the table. Now we're just left with the gray and with a lie. The lie is easy to point out. Lies are very quickly. Lies stick out like a sore thumb because a lie is not related to the gray at all. <coughs> a lie is, uh, for example, if you say there's a cup on the table, but there's no cup on the table and everyone in the room sees there's no cup on the table, you know, even this person might be hallucinating, whatever. The point is, uh, within a consensus reality, we can quickly distinguish there's no cup on the table. That is a lie, right? It is not even, <coughs> it's not related to the gray at all. The, so the so when you're <clears throat> the reason what I'm getting into with all of this is um, for pretexting. Let me back up just a moment. Within investigation, I've heard people who I believe don't have any experience being investigators whatsoever. They have they say like, oh, I'm going to disguise myself as such and such in order to get information from somebody. Like, I'm gonna like. Uh, it's something real fucking simple like we need to find out this like this lady's supposed to be home alone there's two cars in the driveway we need to find out <coughs> who these people are who's in the house well you do that two ways very simple you can go to the door and see who the fuck answers and who you can hear and see from the doorway you can also run the plates of the cars but I will hear people say shit like, well, I will dress up as a power company employee and I'll pretend like I'm working on the fucking power or I will like do this or do that or I will pretend to be like this. It's fucking ridiculous. It that is that is why that means people that say that shit. I'm telling you, they have never fucking been hired and been paid to successfully investigate something like I, you can tell right away somebody who has experience doing investigation and somebody who has never fucking done it when people say that they're going to dress up as a power company employee and like pretend to work on the lines and shit that is somebody who's never done an investigation because that shit is completely ass backwards that is like fucking children's television show shit right there you, that is ridiculous. And this is where I'm trying to get in with this Kusunoki material. That is the lie, right? The truth is that you're an investigator. Well, the truth, quote unquote, is that you're an investigator, right? The truth is like truth fundamentally, like Kusunoki were too. Fundamentally speaking, the truth is that you are a Buddha who is doesn't realize that they're a Buddha. So you're living out a dream of being a human being. That's the ultimate truth. Relative truth is that you are in the gray. So in the gray, you are, quote unquote, a human being who has got the job as an investigator, right? So that is the relative truth. So relatively speaking, you're, a hum you're an investigator, right? A lie is that you are a, 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 a power, uh, the electric company employee. That is a lie. It's not part of the gray because it's not true at all. It's completely fiction. All right. So do you see where I'm trying to go here? So for your pretext for an investigation, you need to make sure that you fall within the gray. You can't hit the truth 
and you need to avoid the relative truth because you don't want any of your marks or assets to really know that you're an investigator, right? You need to, and you, but you have to steer clear of a lie. And that is fundamental. So you, so when, when the texts say not to lie, it's not just some kind of moral thing. Yes, there is a karmic moral reason not to lie, but at the same time, tactically falling into bold, into outright lies is tactically stupid. You need to fall within the gray. You need to fall within something that is reasonable and sort of true from a couple of different perspectives. Something that is not a bold-faced lie. So when you pretext, you could do something like, you don't go to the person's house pretending to be an electric company employee. You don't go to the house pretending to be an, a police officer because that's, that's also extremely illegal and it's just stupid to take that kind of risk, legally speaking. But also it's stupid. It, it becomes even more stupid. And here's one of the reasons why it's just stupid. Um, first off, it's a lie. So when something's a bold-faced lie, it sticks out like a sore thumb and it's just aching to be called out as a lie. So avoid it. It's just tactically stupid. It's also a problem because once you make contact with a person, once they see your face and your, the sphere of you has met the sphere of them, think of a Venn diagram, two spheres coming together, overlapping, right? Once that overlap has taken place, you are now engaged in that person's universe as whatever your pretext was which means from then on the details of the pretext must remain consistent in other words the more lies that you tell under your pretext those lies then have to remain true from that point on it is tactically stupid <laughs> it is tactical blunder to build up a bunch of lies, to build up all this fake shit, because then from that point on, it must all be true. And you put yourself into a box. You really limit your future potential with that asset or that informant, that person, because then uh, there you are. You are this person, right? And they will peg you as that person. <clears throat> it is best... If you're going to go up to the door and knock on the door to see who answers and see who you can see in here, dude, just be a normal fucking person. Don't pretend to be a, a person from a company. Don't pretend to be a fucking electrical employee. Don't pretend to be like, oh, I'm taking a survey, blah, blah, blah. Because the, uh, the thing with surveys, the idea of the survey is not that bad. But here's the thing. In 2017, nobody shows up at your door to do a survey. And if they do, then they better have some kind of coupons or like f payment for the survey. So why would you, I mean, you could get away with that theoretically. You could be like, I'm going to do a survey. It's just five questions. And if you do this right, I'll give you these coupons. And, and you could do that. But then see, that's a lot of extra work because then you have to write a survey and then the survey has to make sense. So it has to, you have to put in time to make a survey that sounds like it would be a real survey. And then you would have to somehow get coupons or some kind of shit that would make the pretext, that would make the illusion can, uh, complete. That's a lot of work because if you give people a shit coupon, that's not real, then, then like they're going to remember you as being a charlatan. They may not realize that you tricked them, but they're, if they ever see you again, they're going to be like, Hey motherfucker, that coupon you gave me wasn't real. You see what I'm saying? Like it's pointless. It's there's no purpose in forming that much falsehood. You want to hit the you want to stay in the gray. You want your pretext to be as real as possible. So morally, in terms of karma and morality, you're not lying. Or your misdirection is very little. It's enough to make it work, but it's very little because again, damage mitigation. You don't want to go around just lying your ass off if you don't have to. Sometimes you may have to. But for the most part, if you're just gathering information, you don't want to create a gigantic false narrative that that you can't even keep track of yourself. 
So the pretext for going to the door could be something as simple as getting the house address wrong or getting the wrong street, right? So you would pull up Google Maps, learn some of the street names, learn some of the numbers of the streets and create a very, very, very feasible story about why you might end up at the wrong house. That's it. Knock on the door and then just, oh, uh, is so-and-so here? No, you've got the wrong house. Oh, my bad. And just leave. Hi, like completely feasible. Within that short amount of time, you can you can assess a lot because now I understand though that when you do that while you're talking to them for those 10 seconds you also have been trained to sort of gather as much intel through different methods you know in terms of hearing and listening and shit like that da, da, da. there's an entire section uh, there's an entire science behind how to gather a lot of information through that doorway very quickly without them even realizing that you've done it but the trick is to get there for 10 seconds in order to make those assessments and make the, get that information. But that, that pretext for that 10 second gap is absolutely not something that you need to go out of the fucking mind with creating. So I, and so what I did, like I saw this on, on uh, the Facebook, the, the shit people talking about, oh, here's a disguise I would use. Why would you use that disguise? Like, what would you, what are you doing? You know? Why would you dress up? It, what are you doing? The best thing that you could do is be as close to you as possible. Like don't use your real name and don't talk about yourself. Let them talk. So it's called reflective listening or, and, or as I called it before, the voice stealing mirror. Talk to them a little bit. There, there's techniques, there's arts for getting them to talk without saying much about yourself get them to talk some then from that you will learn what we call the voice their voice you will learn their voice then you take on their voice and you reflect their voice back to them and then that causes them to talk even more because human beings are now to some kusanoki material Ku, uh, some human beings not all but many human beings are lonely or they're unappreciated or they're very stuck up. There's different reasons. There's different psychological reasons for why the voice stealing mirror works. But it's either because they're very lonely or they're very undervalued or they're very stuck on themselves. But the point is, is when they, they hear themselves, when they hear their own voice. Now, when I say voice, I'm not talking about an audio recording. Listen carefully. When I say their voice, I'm talking about their way of talking. You literally mimic them. And then that on a subtle psychological level makes them comfortable. It fills unfulfilled psychological needs and like magic. And in Kusunokiru, it is considered magic. They then talk more and they start telling you shit that it doesn't make any logical sense why they're revealing so much information to you so quickly. But it is, it is, a, sight, it is a mind game. It is a mind manipulation technique. And you get them to talk and talk and they tell you shit and they tell you shit and they tell you shit. To do that, you do not have to make a giant over-the-top bullshit disguise. You just need to not use your real name and you need to be reflective of the situation. When they say blend into the environment, it doesn't mean to like dress up in camouflage and a ninja hood and hide in a bush. What blend into the environment means is become their world make them comfortable or not it all depends on the, you have to read them this in, in kusunokiru there's an entire psychological system called liberation in two phases and it's based on the uh, liberation through the eyes and ears i actually hold on uh in in sacred conspiracy it's on page hold on yeah check page it's page 140 and I've put the map on there. So the great liberation in two phases. And I've translated it out. You can see where there's allies, enemy, the inner gate, the outer gate, gate of the ear, gate of the eyes. This entire teaching, um, I've studied, I've translated it and studied it and feel like I have a fairly good grasp on it. It is 
absolutely a mixture of spirituality and psychology, and it is fundamentally the psychological root of Kusunokiru and all of the mind manipulation. And it will be, and I will go into it in the book, and I might make a video or two about it in the near future. But for right now, the point is very simple. You have to assess, and it's, it's, it's nothing that you probably haven't heard about. You know, you have to assess someone, and then you have to get a good, so you have to be good at assessing them. Once you've assessed them, you get a particular psychological model like something that's on the chart you find what model what what which one of the hearts that they are the minds that they are and then once you once you have that pegged pretty good you can then engage in specific responses which will then manipulate them to get where you want to so for example on what was it page 10 where were we 140 uh you see how for example under the gate of wind you see, so wind is the is joy, right? So a trifling heart, a pleasure heart, a changing heart, or fire, which was anger, is the defiant heart, a prideful heart, a selfish heart, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So say you find somebody that is um, under water, so you've you've assessed them as water, and then they you've assessed them further to be what's called a tender heart, right? Once you have that, then you can manipulate them if you want to if you want to bring them to power if you want to make them allies that's why allies is on the top of the chart and enemies on the bottom of the chart so if you want to make them allies then you have to do certain manipulations to sort of make them your friend and to empower them and to strengthen them etc to make them out but if you want but it but if you need to remove them off the chessboard you then do a you then do another set of manipulations that depowers them and disenfranchises them and cuts them off and gets them off the chessboard. And uh, basically, great liberation in two phases. I'll go ahead and give you a little bit of the teaching now. It's basically that all the human psychology can be divided among what's called the, the gate of the eyes and the gate of the ears. Gate of the eyes and gate of the ears ultimately boil down to whether they are attracted to external phenomenon or internal phenomenon. External phenomenon is called the gate of the eyes and internal phenomenon is called the gate of the ear. Because the idea, in this particular case, the, the gate of the eyes is um, in, entranced with out, outside things and gate of the ear is entranced with internal things. So you'll see that internally we see fire and wind, so that's the joy and the anger section. And then the gate of the eyes is uh, water and earth, so that a water and earth section are sort of um, the, uh, the objective, the outside. So people of a water or earth are people that are manipulated through external objects more. And then people who are wind or fire are manipulated more by internal factors. And in, um, for example, in Kusunokiru, there is a historical example because in Kusunokiru, it's very, very, there's always some historical example that goes along with the teaching. Uh, they give, um, interestingly enough, uh, Nita, which is a Southern Court General, Nita is, they say, for example, a good example of the gate of the eyes because they say, you know, Kusunoki, when he's writing that, he's literally talking about, because remember, he's writing this at a certain point. And so he writes that Nita, who's another sort of general that's serving under Godaigo, and, and remember, Ashikaga Takuiji was also Kusunoki's a comrade at arms serving under Godaigo originally. So when he wrote, there's a section, he's got a massive commentary on this. He wrote it before shit went down. And he's saying, like, even among our own army, I see that, for example, General Nita is very susceptible to the gate of the eyes. Because, you know, for example, he's just, he likes attractive women and he can be sort of distracted by f attractive females, which is the gate of the eyes. And then he says, however, Ashikaga, my buddy Ashikaga, because at this point Ashikaga hadn't turned on him. My buddy Ashikaga, he is susceptible to the gate of the ear because he likes to hear praise. He likes to hear people talk about him and his fame and his name. Right. And then so the thing is, so gate of the eyes is like, f likes to look at females and then gate of the ears would be likes to hear about how great he is. So that, those are the two main divisions within Kusunokiru. That's page 140 in Sacred Conspiracy. You'll find that chart. So what? I'm, so how does this boil back down to pretexting? 
we get back into pretexting, your pretext does not have to be overly complicated. Your pretexting needs to fall within that gray area. Something extremely believable, something that might even be mostly true. There's just a little bit of manipulation of the facts. Um, like true from a certain point of view or true but left out a few details. Stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> like I said, never use your real name, for example. So that bit's, you know, that's manipulation. But for the most part, the reason that it's totally okay to fall within the gray is because one, you can't fall within the truth because the truth is unattainable by relative mundane human mind. The relative human mind is incapable of truth. It's off the table. <coughs> Lies stand out and are easily found out upon a little bit of investigation because they're based on complete falsehood. And a lie is broken the moment one detail is shown not to be true. And then the lie is off the table. The lie, so lies off the table. You have to fall within the gray. Your pretext has to be within the gray. <clears throat> it has to be something that is true enough, that is based on reality enough, and is avoiding lies so that if investigated, it either appears to be true, relatively true, or upon investigation, it is proven not to be false. And so it must land in the gray. And, the re and it's okay to land in the gray because the information that you're going to get is not dependent upon your pretext. It really is not. It's dependent upon your ability to gather information within particular scenarios. In other words, the door is open for 10 seconds. You have a very simple pretext. In that 10 seconds, while you're running your simple pretext, you do your techniques to gather the information you need within that gap. So there you go with a little bit of shinobi no mono, like kanji, uh, kanja, right? That whole idea of the gap, right? You have a 10 second gap of time. You can gather all the information you need to know in that 10 seconds of gap, but you have to be trained. <clears throat> you can't just go up to the door and be a normal, regular person who doesn't know what they're doing. You, there's training that you do. There's techniques and training for you to be able to figure out everything you need to know in that 10 seconds. And that is utilizing the gap, all right? So you will get, you have a reasonable pretext within the gray area and you have the skill to be able to elicit the information in 10 seconds within that gap. And then if you engage in conversation, you use the reflected, the reflection, the voice stealing mirror, you use that reflective quality, utilizing the uh, liberation in two phases to manipulate the person which that's what the reflective listening, the reflection, that, that voice stealing mirror. You want to strengthen them. You want to, you want, do you want to move them this way? Do you want to move them that way? And that's all by understanding the changes and adaptations of the liberation of two phases using that reflective voice stealing mirror in order to get them to do what you need them to do. And because the true science is found within that one-on-one -on -one human interaction and manipulation, then the pretext does not need to be anything over the top or absurd. The pretext needs to be down to earth, very, very f dis common. You got the wrong house. That's simple. Oh, uh, uh, you thought you were on this street, but really the person you're looking for is this isn't that street. The house number matches, but the street's wrong. Oops, my bad. You know what I mean? Like, nope, oh well, you know. But you can start a conversation or you can something something within that context, right? And then, therefore, if that person ever sees you out and about, they won't care. That's the other thing, to stay off the long-term radar. When you're not trying to be known by somebody, like, for example, if you see somebody at the store on Tuesday morning, and then you see them at another store Saturday afternoon, you might be like, you might remember seeing that guy somewhere, but that's about it. You're not going to be like, oh shit, I saw the same person within the same couple of days. There's a conspiracy out to get me. Like normal human beings don't do that shit. Now, 
conspirators, of course, people who train in conspiracy are like, hmm, I saw that guy Tuesday and then I saw him again on Saturday. I need to be careful, right? <laughs> but regular human beings don't do that. Regular human beings see the same faces. Hell, half the time they don't even remember that they see the same faces. But even if they remember that you're the guy that showed up at their house by p picking the wrong house, they're not going to care. You know, that's the other thing. So I'll go ahead and end this video. But that's the other thing about investigations and all this stuff. People don't care. The average person does not care. Like, you can tell somebody who's actually investigated and somebody who hasn't because the people that haven't investigated overdo it. They don't actually understand human psychology, human sociology. They don't understand how people actually behave and interact on a daily day basis. And they think that they have to go over the top with all kinds of just gratuitously complex bullshit because they think that, that they forget a fundamental thing. And here is the fundamental thing. Are you ready? Here's the fundamental thing. The other person does not know you are investigating them. You know that you're investigating them. They don't know that you're investigating them. Therefore, all of this shit that you feel you need to be precautious about is bullshit in your own mind. They have not the slightest idea that you're getting, that you're watching them and getting information from them. Therefore, no need to have a bullshit disguise. No need to have all of this over-the-top pretext. The simpler, the more realistic, the more down-to-earth, the better. This is even reflected in the Shinobi scrolls, all of those Shinobi no Maki, all of the different things. You know, The more common the pretext, the more successful the more outlandish the more subject to failure right it's that simple so that is a kusunokiru those that's a bunch of different kusunokiru bits and pieces thrown into a 2017 example right so if you do any kind of investigation in 2017 kusunokiru can apply to you because it works <laughs> for lack of a better word you know fundamentally speaking it works now that's not saying that there aren't investigators out there who are successful at doing this exact stuff and they've never even heard of kusunokiru obviously but what i'm trying to say is kusunokiru itself would say the same thing kusunokiru would say if there are people out there that are doing the same stuff that we're doing and they're successful they've never heard about us but they're doing the same shit that we're doing because why? Because the human psyche doesn't change. It doesn't matter if you're a Japanese person in the year 1500 or an American in the year 2017. The fundamental human psyche is exactly the same. And so therefore, a Kusunokiru student says, fundamentally, I have to learn how to manipulate the human mind. And I need to understand sociology. And, and therefore... I won't, for example, show up at their front door as an electrical employee, pretending to be an electrical employee, when all I have to do is just say that I'm looking for so-and-so at such-and-such -such house and then be like, oh, shit, this is the wrong house. This is the wrong street. You know, something that, so simple, right? So simple. But that's the difference, you know, between people that have experience and that have studied this versus people that just think about it, you know, and never really have done something. So that uh there's my ramble and my rant um leave comments if you think i'm stupid leave it if you think that i said something worthwhile leave it go ahead whichever i'd be interested to know in your your response your thoughts your feelings your ideas on everything i've said this is an hour long the first part was specifically about Kusunokiru. And then I started rambling and ranting about my own thoughts based on pretexting and mixing that with Kusunokiru, etc. So what is your thoughts, though? What are your thoughts? Did I say anything that inspired you? Did I say anything that aggravated you? Did I say something that supports an idea? Or did I say something that attacks an idea? You know, you have listened to me for an hour and five, hour and six minutes. 
that is an hour of your time that you've been listening to me. How do you feel? What are your thoughts? All right, take care.